Hey, what I said, what I told him, I said, I'll, I'll, I got a copy of these notes. I'll give them to you. That's what he was. That's, that's what, what I was thinking. thinking. <laughs> oh, hang on a second. Hang on a second. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Right. Find the button. Got it. I think we just launched the missiles. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, is that? Yeah, Amen. Amen. Well, good to be saved. Amen. Good to be in church. Amen. Good to see me. Amen. Well, thank you, thank you, brother. You covered for a lot of quiet right there. I appreciate that. That's kind of the same reaction I got when I, when I came home from school from my parents. Anyway, um, uh, it is good to be saved, guys. It's always good to be in church. You ever make a bad decision? Yeah. You know, like you go to a restaurant and you order the only thing that died in vain. <laughs> or you get in the wrong line at Walmart. Ladies, ladies, I'm going to tell you to buckle the knees of the strongest man on the planet. Wait till he's behind you at Walmart, and when you go to pay, pull out your change purse. <laughs> <sighs> I want to, you know, that's, I just, I just want to throw 20s down and say, here, here, just, just get it out of my way. Just, oh, is, oh, wait, no, that's a, that's a wheat penny. I, I save these for my grace. <laughs> But anyway, so, uh, so I'm going to tell you how to make a good decision. How about if you made a good decision 100% of the time? Amen. Go to church. Amen. It is always a good decision to go to church. Amen. Let me say this. I'm here from now till Wednesday. I don't think you should come back Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night because I'm here. I really do not. I think you should come back because this is your church. Doors are open. Lights are on. Amen. And, and, and that is what you should do, okay? Well, we'll talk to you about a subject that... Uh, uh, that, that it's touchy. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, I am a, a believer in a perfect Bible. Amen. Uh, I say that because people say, well, there's a King James issue. And I say, no, there's not a King James issue. There's really not a King James issue. It's, it, it is, there is a perfect Bible issue. Amen. And I say that because if all of us guys would believe the King James, if today... Uh, we all decided that the King James had mistakes in it, and we no longer believed it, uh, and said it had errors in it. Um, everybody, and, and everybody that's anti-King James would say, amen, amen, right? Yeah. And then if we said, yeah, the King James is the perfect word of God, the English Standard Version is the perfect word of God. Everybody that's anti-King James today, everybody that's anti-King James today would be anti-ESV tomorrow. Right. Because they don't like the thought that there's a book on this planet <clears throat> that is absolutely perfect. And so one of the charges brought against King James Bible, and I'll talk to you, I wrote a couple books on, uh, on this subject, but one of the uh, charges that's brought against your, your Bible is that it has archaic words in it. And um, now, now look, get this straight, okay? Well, I was going to ask. I almost said how many of you ever have been to a police station and asked questions by a policeman, but that's probably not a good, <laughs> you don't want to raise your hand on that. <clears throat> But we've all seen it. We've all seen it in the in the, in the things. You know, the, the suspect is sitting here like this, and the guy's demanding answers, asking questions. Right? Remember this: the people who do not believe the King James, they are not the cops, and you are not the robber. Yeah. Amen. By that I mean they don't have some vested right to demand answers to questions without you demanding some things. The first one is this: if anybody ever says this, here's what you do, because. Because part of this problem is that we acquiesce to everything they say uh, or we, 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 don't, we don't slap back. I'm sorry. You got to go back. Uh, and somebody will say this. Well, there's 300 uh, archaic words in the King James Bible. Okay. Now, they may say 300, may say 400, may say 200, whatever. You have the right, the moment they say that, to say, give me the list. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I want all 300. Come on. If the guy says 300 then he must know there's 300. Yeah. If he doesn't have a list, where'd he get that figure from? Well, that's what I heard. Well, oh, I should throw my Bible on what you heard. Right. Yeah. Okay? And so there's some guys, you know, they say there's uh, all these archaic words in the King James Bible, and, and they're beyond eighth grade school level, which is probably high school by now. Um, <clears throat> they, um, three bottles of water. I'm going to be here a long time, guys. <laughs> I hope you brought a sandwich. Anyway, uh, uh, you know, they'll say there's all these archaic words and they can't understand them, and we're going to talk about that. And then you got the King James guys, uh, who is one, I'm one of them, uh, and they'll say, well, there are no archaic words in the King James Bible. Well, guys, that's not accurate either. Okay? And I'm going to show you one. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 25. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles 
that eat asking no question for conscience sake. All right, what they called a shambles, we would call a marketplace. Back then, it was called a shambles. And probably under democratic rule, it's called a shambles again after they steal $950 worth of stuff from it. But, um, um, but really, guys, you know, you got to remember something. Around the world, a lot of grocery stores don't look like what you walk into. They don't have automatic doors. They don't have air conditioning. They don't have grocery, start, uh, grocery carts that homeless people can steal. Um, it was a shambles. Uh, I talked to a missionary one time. I can't remember what country he was in. It was a, kind of a third world country. <clears throat> and he said, I'm down, the, I'm down in the square, the town square. And that's where all the, that's the marketplace. And he said, way over there, I see this guy is selling something. And he said, it's big and it's black and it's hanging there. But he said, it looks like it's moving. Mm-hmm. You know? And, and, and you ever try to focus your eyes like, like a pattern on wallpaper and you just can't focus your eyes? He couldn't get it. So he said, I'm walking across the square. And he said, I'm looking at it. And he said, and he said I finally got close enough to touch it. When I went to touch it, all the flies yeah. flew off of that piece of meat, which would make me want a salad, okay? <laughs> and I am not a salad person. But I say save the lettuce. But, <clears throat> but shambles is archaic. Archaic simply means it is passed from common usage, correct? All right, now, uh, let me ask you a question. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell it to you. And I know you're gonna, what you're going to say. Do you know why people go to hell? Now, I know what you're going to say, because they don't accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, right? There's another way to describe that. Isn't this why they go to hell? Because you've talked to some people. And why did they reject Jesus Christ? Because they thought they had a better way to handle their salvation than God did. Isn't that why they go to hell? Well, I think I'm being good enough. They, they have a better way to handle it than God is. Guys, you get into trouble. People go to hell for doing what? Handling something better than the way God has. So we're going to get, we're going to get back to that. But, but here's the problem. Here's the problem. I told you the archaic words in the Bible. And, and you at least got to be honest enough to admit that. Because if you won't admit that, you become a Democrat. <clears throat> All right? Like this. The word a right. Now, I don't think anybody uses that anymore unless you just got hit by a left. <laughs> but that's what we say. We say, I'm going to set it a right. A right. How about this one? Deride. Deride <clears throat> is waiting outside. Um, <laughs> as a rule, we don't, we don't use that anymore. You probably have, look, the words I'm going to put on the board, you say, well, I don't know if those are archaic. Bet you haven't used them in a month. I'll bet you haven't used them farther than that. But if they're not archaic, you'd, you'd have been using them by now. Uh, well, how about odious? Yeah. Now, if, you, if you've never used odious, here's what you do. Go to Europe and get on an elevator with somebody. <laughs> and it's twice as bad. Number one, number one, they don't bathe. Number two, their elevators are half the size of ours. Yeah. Really, they're about this big. You're claustrophobic. It's like getting in a, in a coffin that goes up and down. <laughs> But, but if you got on that elevator, this at least would pass through your mind, okay? Um, how about this word, trafficked? With a K on the end. We don't spell trafficked like that. Say what? That's our kick. Oh, here's one. I'll bet you use this this week. Unto. Where are you going? I'm going unto the mall. We don't talk that way. Look, I'm not ripping on your Bible, but archaic is archaic, and I think we ought to admit it. Um, Yoke fellow. I'll bet that's one you just this week. So, So, guys, you have to just be honest enough to say that some words are archaic, uh, like this one. Didst. You probably didn't use that. Or doest. Or dust. Now, I've, th- I've used that one a lot when I visit people's houses. <laughs> which means no one here will invite us over this week. <laughs> I can see that coming now. I, I would say, dust thou dust. Anyway. Um, gavest. Nobody says that. And here's those... 
nasty words, thee and thine. <coughs> now I'm not, like I said, uh, I'm, not, I'm not ripping on your Bible, but you just got to admit that archaic is archaic, like beggarly. Now I know you probably thought that getting on the interstate at times. Or asunder. Or comely. These are, these are words. Oh, ladies, wives, wives. You want to get rid of him? <laughs> I can tell you how you can get rid of your husband. No crime will be committed. <laughs> you don't have a body to bury, okay? Here's what you do. Here's what you do. When he's at work, say, stop by the grocery store and don't come home until you bring me a gallon of M-I-L-C-H, milk. And he's a goner. I mean, he'll be wandering around the grocery store like he does in your bedroom looking for his socks. Where are my socks? Where are my socks? Oh, you, thank you for the socks. Where are my feet? Where are my feet? I just said it. You said, nobody calls it milk, M-I-L-C-H. Right? You'll never see that in a grocery store anywhere. Um, how about paramours? You know what paramours are. That's two mores. Uh, how about warp? Uh, people, that word comes to their mind when I'm teaching. And wet. Uh, wet, not like it got wet, but like when you sharpen a knife, that's called wetting the edge, okay? But it's not a word <clears throat> that, we, that is in common usage now. How about, um, how about this one? Assuaged. Yeah, I did, I'll bet you use it just this week. Um, oh, uh, beggarly. No, I used beggarly, didn't I? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Begot. Or bemoan. Yeah, this usually comes around tax time. <laughs> um, surfeit. Now, you Californians probably use that a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Abraded. Now, you probably didn't use that unless you just got back from Jamaica. Uh, guys, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not ripping on your Bible, okay? I really am not. But, and, and you, might, you might pick one of these and say, well, I don't think that one's archaic, or I don't think that one is. But, but as a general rule, those words have passed from common usage, correct? So I think you ought to call archaic, archaic. There's only one problem with that whole list. I didn't get any of those out of a King James Bible. You say, I saw them in a King James Bible. I didn't say they're, I didn't say they're not in. I said, I didn't get those lists from a King James Bible. Uh, I got them, the first one, I got it from the New International Version of 1973. You know, the one that they took all the archaic words out of. Uh, the second one I got from the American Standard Version of 1901. No, I was not there when it was published. Uh, this third one, here's one you guys want to remember. The New King James Version. You know, that book that is so much easier to read than a King James. Yeah. And the fourth one is from the New Revised Standard Version of 1999. Oh, yeah. Now, guys, you know what that proves? Well, if you... Now, see, here's, here's what I tell people. Have, have, are we watching... Are we watching... If, if there's anything we're seeing in our country, are we not watching a lot of hypocrisy? I believe in free speech, unless it's yours, right? right? right. Uh, I, think, uh, I think you have a, it's a woman's choice, unless it's about the vaccine, then it's forced on her. Yeah. Don't we hate people that say there's wrong and it's in their own camp? Yeah. Yeah. Guys, how can they criticize King James Bible when every one of them has archaic words in it? Right. Now, if somebody says, well, you know, I, I, I don't hate the King James Bible, I just have a problem with archaic words. And this is why... Uh, I, I will be giving this list. Now, some of this other stuff I'll give won't be on the list, but, but I'll give you a list of, um, 
about 30 archaic words in every one of these versions. And here's what you do. Keep it in the Bible. Now, I'm not a fisherman, okay? Guys, if you fish, that's great. Uh, when I hunt, fish, or golf, you find out where they're four-letter words. I just, <laughs> you know, when I go fishing, it's just worm murder, okay? I feel sorry for the worm. Not that it's dying, but it's dying for nothing. <laughs> and, and you say, well, you know, I'm not good, but you know what I can catch? I can catch people. Amen. Well, I can do that. So here's what you do. When, when your preacher passes, out, passes this out, put it in your Bible. And then when somebody says, we well, see, that's the problem with the King James Bible. I just have a problem with those archaic words. And then just say, oh, you have a problem with words like uh, dits, doest, dus, gave us. Yeah, yeah, those archaic words. And, and unto and odious. Oh, yeah, I have trouble with that. And milk, M-I-L-C-H, and, uh, and calmly, and surf. Yeah, that's the problem. And then pull this out. See, if somebody's going to have a problem with archaic words, I want them to say this. I have a problem with the archaic words in the King James Bible and the NIV. Yeah and the American Standard Version, and the New King James Version, Amen. and the New Revised Standard Version. They never say that, right. which means this is not about archaic words. This is about hating that book. Yes. But, guys, this teaches you something else. You know what this teaches you? Think about this. One of the set goals of every one of these translations was to get rid of archaic words. Oh, yeah. And they all failed. You know what that tells me? It can't be done. So why would you get rid of a Bible with archaic words to get a Bible with archaic words? So this shows you that there's archaic words in every other version. Now, uh, I, I, I'm going to lay this on you. It's not the first time you heard it, but I'm going to hold you to it, okay? Don't we say this? The Bible is my final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. When we say that, you know what we really mean? We get two things from the Bible. The Bible's where I get my doctrine from, and that's where I get a verse that shows so-and-so that I was right and they were wrong. <laughs> that's the only thing we're interested in the Bible for, guys. But it's not just a doctrine. This is not a doctrine textbook, okay? Amen. So when we say it's my final authority, you know what final authority is? Every father here knows what final authority is. I talk to these parents, and they're afraid somebody's going to teach their kid four-letter words. I'm still looking for the guy that taught my kids the three-letter words. Why? <laughs> Doesn't that just kind of raise your blood pressure hearing it? Yeah. Okay, we have to go now. Why? Well, well, we, have, we want to go now because if we don't go now, we're going to be late. Why? <laughs> well, we don't want to be late. Why? Well, because we don't want to be the last ones there. Why? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a father. I've had the classes. I have the diploma. Here it is. Because I said so! Yes, yes! Do you know what that statement is? Final authority. Final authority. <laughs> and I got news for it. Wait a minute. You know, well, that's kind of harsh. It's going to be harsh when somebody says, I got baptized and stayed in church, and God says, you're going to hell. Yeah. How come? I said so. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we say the Bible is our final authority in what? All matters. Whoa, 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 whoa. See, you're thinking doctrine. You're thinking salvation. You're thinking when an argument. All matters? What about the, all ma what about the matter of? Archaic words. Yeah. The Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith in what? Right. Practice. Why do we baptize by immersion? It's the only practice that we see in Scripture. You don't see sprinkling babies. You don't see pouring anything on anybody's head. You see somebody going down into the water and getting baptized, all right? So if the Bible is our final authority, which means once... You know, I've heard people say this all the time. Well, I don't like that. You ever get these people, probably you, you believe the Bible? I sure do. And then you show them something, they go, well, I don't believe that. <laughs> okay, I believe 90% of it. <clears throat> so here's what we need. We need to find some place in the Bible where we see God's practice for our kick words. Because there are our kick words, and we've got to figure out shambles here, see. Because here's what they're going to say. Scratch shambles out and write marketplace or get a new translation that says marketplace, right? Okay. But if we can find God's method, God's practice of how he takes care of our kick words, then that's the one we should use no matter what anybody says. So I want you to go back to a book with a good, honest-sounding name. Go back to 1 Samuel. <laughs> <clears throat> so remember, there's only one Joshua. There's two Samuels. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 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 I, I, I was so harsh to your pastor yesterday. 
Uh, Brother Earl was welding my bumper. Brother Earl, you know the welding was good, but the paint job was even better. Because when I was looking in the mirror as it was tumbling down the road behind me, I said, boy, that bumper is sure nice paint job. <laughs> the bumper, amongst other things, was falling off my, tra uh, off my trailer yesterday. Brother Earl, uh, he, uh, he took care of it before. He did a great job. Amen. He did. All right. Take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 9. <coughs> Let's get the context. Now, there was a, uh, a man of Benjamin uh, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zorah, the son of Bacharath, the son of Aphia, Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a goodly young man, uh, a choice young man, a goodly. Uh, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish <clears throat> said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. So here's what happens. Kish lost some jackasses. That's what, he, that's what he's talking about, donkeys, jackasses. I'm not cussing. Uh, and he wants his son to go see him. Now, they, they were found later at Democratic headquarters. <laughs> verse 4. Uh, and he passed through Mount Ephraim. Well, 4 is where he's looking for him. Now, now look at verse 5. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said unto his servant... Uh, that was with him, come and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. Now, I'll tell you how he could have found them real easy. Just said to his wife, where are those jackasses? She would know. Because yeah, my, no my wife knows where everything is that I can't find. Yeah. I've called her from motel rooms where she wasn't with me, and I'd say, where are my socks? <laughs> and she said, you look in a suitcase? I said, I opened it. I called them. <laughs> they didn't come out. And, and, and she, and, or we'll be in a motel room, and I'll go, where are my socks? And she'll walk over to the open, open suitcase like this. <laughs> I was just testing you. <laughs> I wanted to see if you knew. <clears throat> so he can't find him, uh, and he says, okay, let's go back to our dad, uh, to my dad, because he, he's going to uh, think that we lost, uh, we lost him. Look at verse 6. And he said to him, this is the servant. Behold, now, there is, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go, to get, go thither. Peradventure, he can show us our way that we should go. Now, guys, guys, I got to say this. We don't follow tradition. We follow the Word of God, correct? I know that. I do, I know that. But there's one little tradition. I don't know who got rid of it, but I wish we'd have kept it. You know what it is? Every time you ask a man of God a question, you give him a gift. <laughs> oh, I took my own breath away. Hang on. Okay. No, you say, oh, because you want things. No, I don't want stupid questions. <laughs> really? Really? I, I had a guy one time, he sent me a, he sent me a list of uh, 36 questions. I still remember. So I answered five. Well, I did. I mean, I mean, some of them were just re redundant and stupid. They were, hey, what do you do that? That kind of question, you know. And so I took the, I took the meat. I answered five of them. I sent it back to him. Uh, and I said, uh, look, uh, I said, you got them now. You're going to have to wing it on the rest of them. So he writes back and he says, well, at least we have a dialogue going. Well, here's the problem. I take, I take two, two letters. Somebody asks me a question, I, I respond. They ask me another question, I respond. That's it. Because you can go back and forth all day long, especially with texting and email. Okay, and I really have stuff to do. But now think about this. What if this guy had to drop a 20 every time he asked me a question? You think he'd ask me 36 questions? Uh, he might have said, oh, you know what? I, I really, that's really not worth asking. You know, how, look, I've been doing this for over 50 years, and, and you, get, you get questions from two kinds of people. One of them wants an answer, and the other wants questions. Here's how you know. They've got a question. They're puzzled. Hey, what about this? You give them the answer, and they go... Oh, thank you. Yeah, that explains it. Have you ever done that? No. Okay. Then there's the one that they, you know, they'll ask about Easter proper, whether it should be in there or not, which is one of the toughest ones there is. You get in the answer and go, oh, yeah? Well, then what about this? Yeah. And so some people ask questions just to have questions. Yeah. And I, look, guys, I'm dying. I'm dying. Say, what is it? Old age. I'm dying. <laughs> I am not spending my time answering questions from a guy that I know the answers don't mean anything. Right. Yeah. But if he had to pay for every question, you'd think he'd do it? <sighs> Bring it back. <laughs> Look at verse 7. 
Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? It's wonderful. And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. <laughs> that will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Now, I want you to do one thing. I don't want you to read it. I do not want you to read it. I want you to look at it. Look at verse 8. Just look at it. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 10. What do you see different about verse 9? It's in parentheses. Do you know what parentheses is? That is a note from the writer to the reader, okay? I could be writing somebody right now, and I could say, uh, I'm in San Diego, parenthesis, Josh Stevenson's church, parenthesis. Uh, it's not a necessary part of the narrative. Now, here's what I mean. Watch, I'm going to read verse 8, and then read verse 10 right after it. And you're going to see, you're not going to go, wow, uh, something's missing. You're going to like something was in the narrative. Watch, verse 8. Uh, and the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give the man of God to tell us our way. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. Notice there's no gap. There's no gap in the narrative. But when God wrote verse 8 or inspired verse 8, he says, I need... Now look, I'm going to tell you something, guys. Do you believe God wrote the Bible to you? Amen. Is that precious to you? Yes. You know what's even more precious? He wrote us the book, and every now and then he said... Oh, and I want to give you a little note. Yeah. Amen. What a wonderful thing. I mean, Amen. oh, by the way, Gip, you're not going to get this. So Amen. I'll tell you where your socks are. Um, Amen. Now we're going to read verse 8, 9, and 10 and, and continue on. Uh, and the servant answered, <clears throat> answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God, uh, the, the, the man of God to tell us our way. Parenthesis, before time in Israel... When a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Hey, guys, did verse 9 not tell you that the word seer, that when this took place, a man of God was known as a seer. But by the time it was written down, they no longer called him a seer. They called him a prophet. Uh, that has happened in this country. Go back 150 years I'd have been there. Your pastor wouldn't. But anyway, but no, if we, were, if we were back 150 years, your pastor would go downtown. They'd say, good morning, Parson, because that's what they called him. If a guy calls him Parson today, he's grabbing an archaic term, hello, Parson, right? But, but today it would be reverend or pastor because Parson is passed from common usage. Seer, at the time this is written, uh, it was passed from common usage. Let's read verse 9 again. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, Come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water and said unto them, Is the prophet here? No. No? no. What's it say? Seer. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, it does say seer. Are you telling me that God himself won't change a word of the text? Amen. Amen. Now think about this. If God thought like a modern translator, wouldn't he, when this was going to be written down, just forget about verse 9, shorten the whole chapter by one verse. The whole Bible would be shorter. You might read it now. <laughs> but, but he could have just put prophet in and never talked about the issue of the archaic word. Right, right. But what did God do? Before you got to the archaic word, he explained the difference. It, they used to call, say, call him a seer, now they call him a prophet. But your final authority did not alter one word of the text. Amen. Look at verse 18. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. He's not asking for the mall. Okay? I mean, that's the second time. Look at verse, look at verse 19. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. That is three times God could have taken the archaic word out of the text, and he never did. But before you got to it, he told you what it was. Now, let's go back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice, and now we've seen the Bible practice for archaic words. So there's nothing wrong if I'm... I'm I'm preaching out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I get to verse 25. Say, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. 
Nothing wrong with that. If I say this. Now, guys, what they call it, I said it earlier. What they call a shambles, we call a marketplace. That is an explanation. That is doing exactly what the parenthesis did. Isn't that true? Yes. Here's what's wrong. If I say scratch shambles out and write seer in the margin, haven't I just, haven't I just said I got a better way to handle it than God does? Yes. How about this? Uh, beloved, you know I love the King James Bible. Whenever a guy says that, I know he's about to correct it. Yeah. I mean, I love the King James Bible. Now I'm just going to carve it up with my knife. If I say, uh, I love the King James Bible, but this is one of those unfortunate translations, one of those archaic words, your spiritual growth has been stunted because of this, and, and you need a modern translation. It gets rid of the word seer so you can understand. I'm sorry, I can't find a modern translation that doesn't have archaic words. I'm telling you, if they're working on one right now and it comes out tomorrow, you'll never find the archaic words because you're not going to read it. <laughs> I'm serious. The, the bad ones? I read the New King James four times cover to cover. Man, that is like, I'm hoping there's a special, you know, award for that. All right? It's very painful. It's like, it's like eating spinach, you know, and I don't get strong. But um, guys, this proves you can't get rid of the archaic words. Yeah. And see that, so it's not about archaic words, is it? It's about getting rid of the book. Now, um, I want you to look at something. I don't know if you have this. Oh, I've got to go back again. I'm sorry. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 9. And uh, I have a date up there as, as 1095 B.C. That's 1095 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to go to... Um, Second Chronicles chapter 29. And maybe there's a purpose for Chronicles. <laughs> Second Chronicles chapter 29. I don't think I have Second Chronicles in this version. <laughs> Hang on. Got it. Okay. Um, back in 1095 B.C., Seer is our kick, correct? Uh, look at verse 30. <clears throat> moreover, moreover, this is, by the way, this is uh, 726. This is 369 years. 300. 369 years after 1 Samuel. So I'm guessing. I'm guessing if it's our kick now, it's probably going to be our kick 369 years from now. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord uh, with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. seer. Now, there's a second thing that I get upset with Bible believers about. One is, I told you, uh, we submit to them asking us questions and demanding answers and never ask any ourselves. The second one, we argue their argument. I'll bet you somebody, when you saw the word seer in that verse, went, well, well, maybe it should have been translated prophet and the King James guys just, just messed it up. Let them say that. Yeah. Really. If that came into your mind, that wasn't from God. Right. Say, so how do you know? Well, you could be right. You could be right. Maybe it's prophet and, the, and they translate it seer, except for verse 25. And he said, the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalters, uh, and with harps, according to the commandment of David and of Gad the king's seer and Nathan the Whoa. God used two different Hebrew words. One of them, say, what's, what's a Hebrew word for? Well, the one for seer is actually the Hebrew word for seer. And the one for prophet is actually the Hebrew word for prophet, which means 395 for sure years that after this word is archaic, God chose to put it in there. Yeah. Now, you would tell him he can't do it? You say, well, why would God do that? The only, the only answer I have, how do you like your steak? Well, how do you like your steak? How do you like yours? Medium rare? Oh, I really like you, Ralph. Anybody like it? Well done. Yeah. How about rare? How about, uh, what is there, something else? Medi medium? Is it medium? Okay. There's no wrong way. It's what you want. Correct? That's your preference. You can get your steak. Look, if I, if I go out, take you out for a steak. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> but if I, take, if I take you out for a steak... And you order steak, and I order mine medium rare, and you say, I like mine well done. I say, no, no, cook it, eat medium rare. He has to eat it the way I do. No, get it the way you want it. Here's what I'm asking. Don't you think God, I mean, don't you think with the job, he has a preference? He can say seer and prophet, and he can use seer up to 369 years 
after it's archaic? Yeah. If you want to correct him, I'm all for it. I want to be there when you do it. Okay? <laughs> now, I'm going to stand about 60 feet off. I want to be outside the flash zone, but I want to see. I want to see when you tell God that he had no right to use an archaic word. Now, I'll tell you what I don't do. I don't call people names. Well, I don't. I don't, I don't call a guy's name and say this guy and mention his name and say this and this. I don't do that. But I'm going to mention a guy's name. And I'm going to call him a deceiver and a liar. You know why? Because he's a deceiver and a liar. No, he's not in the White House. <clears throat> I'm going to mention another deceiver and liar. Jack Lewis. Say, I don't know Jack Lewis. I don't know him either. But he's a deceiver and a liar. Say, why? Published a book many years ago. I have a copy. Uh, and it's, uh, it's got a title. I think it's called An Evaluation of the Versions. Uh, on the, on the, um, the dust cover... It, it shows a stack of different translations, and it's an evaluation of the verses. Now, when you hear that title, don't you immediately say, oh, he's looked at every modern ver every version, King James and all of them, and he's giving you the high points and low points, the strengths and the weaknesses, correct? An evaluation. Not at all. Now, here's what I say, guys. If I can't get past the table of contents without finding a problem, this guy's got a problem. Do you know what the chapter for the, um, for the New International Version is called? the New International Version. Do you know what the chapter for the American Standard Version is called? American Standard Version. Anybody want to guess what this one is? New King James Version. Anybody want to guess what this one is? New Revised Standard Version. So what's the King James Bible? Which would, you would think it would be King James Version. No. No, the title for the chapter of the King James Version is Doctrinal Problems in the King James Version. Now, when I see he's giving every version just a title and, and, he, and he already throws a stone at the King James at the title of, name of the chapter... He's not, this is not an objective evaluation. Right. Somebody's deceiving. Now, I want to say this. I'd never heard that charge before. I've heard a lot of charges against King James Bible. Doctrinal problems? Ain't that where we get our doctrine from? Correct. When people say, I can find the doctrine in my modern translation, that means you saw it 20 times in a King James, right. and you can find it three times in a new right. translation. Right. But you learned it from a King James. Right. So yeah. I thought doctrinal problems. Now, I figured this. Before I even went to the chapter, I knew what he did. He came up with a definition for a doctrinal problem so that he could say there's a doctrinal problem in the King James Bible. Oh, okay. And here's what he says. Here's a doctrinal problem. Uh, the King James Bible has a doctrinal problem any place it does not clearly write, uh, uh, describe a doctrine. Now, you think I'm going to say that's not fair. I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to buy it. If a doctrinal problem is anywhere a Bible doesn't give a doctrine clearly, leave doctrinal problems in the King James Version alone. And then I'm going to change this to doctrinal problems in the New International Version. Yeah, right. Doctrinal problems in the American Standard Version. Doctrinal problems. You say, why? Because those guys really have it. Yeah, do, All right? Uh, I can show you this one re re receives the, or removes the sonship of Jesus Christ four times with bad translation. I, I caught the, uh, I did a, a national television program back in 1995, and the head of that trans translation committee was on national television and I nailed him on his faulty translation. And the host, you know what he did? John Ankerberg. He rode to, his, he rode to this guy's rescue, cut off, and they went to a commercial. So, so if there's doctrinal problems with the King James, and, and, he, and he says that, but he doesn't say about the others, then he's the deceiver. But I said he was a liar. Well, the only reason I said he's a liar is because he's a liar. <laughs> He gives, now this, he pops up with 300. Now, now think about this, guys. If somebody says to you, you're, you're at the gas station, well, there's 300 archaic words in the King James Bible. You really don't expect them to have it in the back pocket. But if a guy's writing a book, why can't he give all 300? Well, to take up so much space. Oh, come on, man. Oh, I could be elected president. Anyway, <laughs> you, could get them, you could get them all in a couple of pages. And if you say there's 300, you ought to prove, prove 300, pr provide 300. He doesn't. He provides, like I do, about 30. But in his, in his list of archaic words, he puts this. Talitha kumi. <laughs> yeah, your pastor said it. That's not, that's not archaic. That's Aramaic. That's a, if you'd have put the word in French, you wouldn't say it's an archaic word. You'd say it's a French word, right? right. 
So the guy put a word, two words from another language and called her a kick. Now, I told you, don't defend them and don't argue the case. I don't know what somebody just said. I know what you thought. Well, maybe he didn't know. Well, we have to decide if he did or didn't. If he didn't, he's too stupid to write the book. If he did, that's deceit. But that's not the kicker. I got a 2017 Dodge Ram truck out there, three-quarter ton. It's a nice truck, nice truck. I'm going to give it to somebody here. This morning, I'm going to give it to you. All you got to do is show me these archaic words. <laughs> he puts sanctum, sanctorum. He says sanctum, sanctorum are two archaic words in the King James Bible. I got the book. I will give you my truck if you'll bring me your King James Bible and show me those words in the text, yeah. not you wrote them in the margin. <laughs> I know you're Americans and you're crooked, but guys, really, really, these words are not found anywhere right. in a king, and never were. You know where this comes from, Sanctum Sanctorum? That comes from the Wycliffe English translation of 1380. That's just a mere 600, 550 years before your King James Bible was translated. Now, I'm sorry. You say, don't say. Maybe you didn't know. If he didn't know, he's not qualified to write the book. Guys, listen, I write some stuff, and I do some study, and I'm qualified to write the stuff I write. If that guy wrote this book and didn't know, he's not qualified to write the book. If he did know, he's a liar. Right. And I'd like to have, I'd listen, if he's sitting right here, not, not where you are, Ralph, but over there. <laughs> you might want to move over, though, because he's over there. <laughs> if he was sitting right there, I would call him a deceiver and a liar to his face. Now, I, I wouldn't if Hillary was sitting there because they might find me in a national park somewhere with four bullet holes in my head, five guns laying on the ground, six notes. Hey, Hillary didn't know anything about this. So, guys, now you have this. You have, you, you have proof, and you, the preacher will give you a copy of the notes maybe tomorrow or something. I don't know. I'll give you the copy, and you can get them copied at your leisure. He'll give you a copy of, of the 30 archaic words in, modern, in these four modern translations, and you say, well, what about the newest ESB? Well, why don't you read it and find them? Why don't you read it and find them? You don't even want to read the King James, let alone a bad one. Isn't that true? I hear these people all the time. You know, well, what about this? Well, you go find it. I've had people say, well, the Bible says this. And I'll say, where? I know right where it is. I'll say, where? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. It's in there. I said, find it. If, you're, if you can't find the reference you're going to slap on the Bible, then just go get a burger. Save his time and your embarrassment. Amen. But the fact is, every modern translation, they say they're going to get rid of the archaic words, and they put them in. I don't think they know it, but they're not qualified, guys. It's like a bunch of four-year-olds running around. So archaic words are found in every modern translation. So if somebody says to you, well, I just have a problem with the archaic words in the King James Bible. So do you have the pro a problem with archaic words in the NIV? Or better yet, just show them those archaic words. Yeah. And, then, and when they say, yeah, those are the words. Those, yeah, those are right there. That's, that's the whole problem. Good, because those aren't in there. I, I didn't get those out of King James. And tell them where you got them. But then you can say, but I found in my final authority. In all matters, you mean the matter of archaic words, yes, and practice. You mean the Bible, God's practice for archaic words, yes. God's practice for archaic words. Here's what God does. When you're coming to an archaic word, he says what they call the shambles, we call a marketplace. Nothing wrong with that. You say, change the book in any way. You have said, I found a better way to handle it than God does. You guys, you don't want to mess with your salvation that way. And really... Uh, I'll bet you since you've been saved, you've had God try to tell you to do something and you didn't do it and got in trouble. Yeah. So that, that, is, that, that is the uh, message on archaic words. The pastor will get those notes to you and we can take a break. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and take a break. We'll be back in here in just a few minutes. Good stuff, amen.